Faith and fear cannot live in the same heart. My name is Mairead Peebles. I live with my husband Jim and our family here in the village of Ballycally, in the Drummond Hotel, Ballycally. My story starts really with a trip that I took to Medjugorje in 1985. I always was fascinated as a child by Padre Pio. And one day in 1985, I opened a, a local paper and there was a, a trip going to the shrines of Italy, including Medjugorje in Yugoslavia. I had never heard of that place, but I rang up to check that Padre Pio's tomb was on that, that he was on that uh, trip. and I rang up that day. I said, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that I'm going on that trip. Even though at that time I had no money, I didn't know where I'd get the fare, anything. But my desire was so great to go to Padre Pio's tomb. And six weeks later, we were on a bus on our way to, uh, to Italy, to the shrines of Italy. in our hotel in San Giovanni uh, at dinner and the priest whom I didn't know was coming around all the tables and asking who are you and where are you from and why have you come and I was uh, thinking about that and he asked me and I said well I'm I always wanted to come to Padre Pio and he said are you praying for anything in particular and I said my oldest son um, has difficulties and he has no confidence I'm really praying for my son and he asked more about my son. And then he said, can I ask you a very personal question? And I said, yeah. And he said, do you love yourself? No one had ever asked that question of me ever before. And I, I stopped and I thought, and I said, no, I don't. And he said, if you don't love yourself, you don't love anything. You don't love your son. You don't love God. You don't love anything. He said, tonight we're going up to the monastery, and uh, Padre Pio's monastery. And he said, I'm going to do something very special for families in the monastery. We're going to be right above Padre Pio's tomb. And uh, so we went up to the monastery that night. Now I have to say, my mom was a woman who went to Mass every morning in life. She always liked to go to the front seat of the church as well. She marched me up to the front seat. And I would normally go to the back or the pretty far back but she took me right up to the front. And um, Father exposed the Blessed Sacrament. And he said, now, he said, I want you to um, relax yourselves and I want you to, to close your eyes and I want you to see Jesus in front of you. And he's right here with you. And he said, I want you to take his hand and I want you to walk through your life with Jesus. Go back to the first thing you can ever remember and walk with Jesus through your life. And I, I don't have a good imagination or anything like that, but I closed my eyes. And in a moment, I was back to about three years old and I started to walk through my life with Jesus. I started to cry and I, I was the oldest in the family of eight, my mom relied on me for a lot of things. Um, and when I started to come through my life, I really discovered that I'd never really felt loved. And as I started to come through my life with the memories, I started to cry and cry and cry. And the ache in me was just awful. Um, and just like all these memories kept coming and coming and coming of rejection, of... Um, no affirmation, nothing like that at all. And um, 
And I have to say that the trip was for 10 days and I cried for the full 10 days. Every day I cried. We ended up in Medjugorje after two or three days. And uh, people were saying, our lady's appearing in Medjugorje. She's appearing every day to six children. And um, so I went with the group up the, on that, e that evening we were. Father said he wanted everyone to come into the church because the rosary was being prayed in the church. But the ache in me was so huge and so much stuff was coming up, so many memories. And um, someone told me that Our Lady was appearing in the ho this house where the priests lived. I walked around and I saw hundreds and hundreds of people at the front of the house. So I came round to the side of the building and I knelt down and I tried to remember, I couldn't remember how to pray the rosary, but I started to pray the rosary. And as I came to the Hail Holy Queen, I cried out to Our Lady and I said, Blessed Mother, I don't know if it is possible that you are here in this place at this time. I need you, Mother. I really, really need you. And in that moment, I felt her arms around me. And I felt loved in a way that I had never ever experienced in my entire life. So as we journeyed on on that trip, uh, that I had to forgive my mom, maybe not being the mother that I really needed. I started to see things like pieces of the jigsaw started to come into place for me to understand. And I remember when I was on the bus on the, en route to Dublin airport at the start of this journey, I remember feeling so empty. But whenever um, in Medjugorje, when Our Lady came to me, I was six foot off the air. I had never, ever, ever experienced anything like it. And we had a talk while we were in Medjugorje about one, with one of the sisters. And she said, Our Lady recommends that we, that we every Thursday, read Matthew 6, 24 to 31. No man can have two masters. He will either hate one and love the other. I was very, very business orientated, making money. But on that trip, I realized that what is success? What is success? You climb this ladder of success, you get to the top of the ladder. There's absolutely nothing there. There's nothing there. And Our Lady said, you cannot have two masters. And I was completely ruled by this stuff, you know, success. and. Uh, Another thing that happened in Medjugorje was, there was a beautiful Franciscan priest said Mass on the only morning I was there. I was only in Medjugorje for a few hours. But at the Mass he said, are you hot or cold for God? He said, or are you one of these people who's on the fence? You're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. And when he said that, I thought, that is me. And he said, you know, it's written in the book of Revelation. If you are neither hot nor cold, you are lukewarm. And, therefore, and when God puts lukewarm water in his mouth, it makes him sick. And I thought, I make God sick. I'm, I'm on the fence. I'm neither one thing or the other. I make God sick. And the other thing was at that time, her message was, abandon yourselves to God. When a soul is totally abandoned to God, Satan is powerless. And I thought, wow, abandon yourselves to God. And when I was there, I really believed that I was being asked to totally abandon myself to God. And it was like to jump off the edge of a cliff and jump into the arms of God and trust Him with everything. And I knew as well and that at that time I had five beautiful children that I wasn't being the mother that I should have been that I was so consumed with business, making money, and um, that my children were, I was absent, too absent for my children. And I realized I can be a businesswoman any old day, but you know, you only get one chance of being a mother. And when your children are young, they need their mother. And that this was the time that I had to give to my children. I had to forget about money and business and concentrate on being a mother.
when I came back from Medjugorje, I really felt we'll sell the hotel, we'll just get out of this place. And if we get out of here and we owe nobody any money, we'll just get a simple house, we'll live on a hill or wherever, just away, and we'll concentrate on, on, on family. And uh, there was a priest that I admired very much um, who used to come and say Mass in Limavati. And I called him and I asked her to speak to him. So I was telling him everything that had happened to Medjugorje. And I said, Father, I think I want to sell up and just get out of the hotel. And he said, you know, have a think about that. Because he said, there is a place for the innkeeper in the scriptures. And when he said that, I, it really kind of it, it hit me. So um, we uh, continued on. That was in July of 1985. And that uh, following uh, maybe November, we got a call from an, an estate agent who said, uh, would you be interested in selling your hotel? And I said, well, everything has a price. And I thought, this is the answer to prayer. This is it. And uh, so anyway, the, the guy came along, looked at the hotel. He asked how much we wanted. And I thought, well, we'll ask enough to pay everybody we owe and we'll have money left for a house. So we named a price, no problem. And everything was going beautifully. And he was coming back and forward and having meetings with us. And um, But every time he came and every time we met up, something was, uh, I was uncomfortable. Something just was stirring in me that just wasn't comfortable. And the last time that he came, it was after Christmas, and uh, he came to see me, and uh, I just felt this uneasiness about the whole thing. So I went to bed that night, and I, um, before I went to bed, I knelt down and I prayed, I said, Lord, I prayed for someone to come and buy this hotel. And here is this man, he's given us all the money we want. It all seems the answer to prayer, it all seems wonderful. But there's something not right inside of me. But I don't know what your will is. So Lord, I'm just asking you to please, if you don't want us to sell, get him to change his mind, that he changes his mind and he doesn't want to buy the hotel. And if he doesn't change his mind, I'm selling, Lord. We're, we're gonna sell. So the next morning, I got a phone call from the guy and he said, uh, Mrs. Peebles, uh, it's Mr. Stewart here. He said, my surveyor was with you with, out at the hotel last week. And unfortunately, he saw two cracks in your building. And I'm so, so sorry to tell you that uh, we've decided to withdraw our offer. I said, Mr. Stewart, that's just fine. Thank you very much. And I put the phone down. The other thing was, uh, ever since I came back from Medjugorje, this was months later, I couldn't stop telling people about Medjugorje because in 1985, nobody really knew any, never had heard of it, didn't know anything about it. And um, I would wake up in the morning and I would say, right, today I am not going to mention the word Medjugorje. And I wouldn't be down the stairs five minutes till someone would be in here and I'd be telling them something about Our Lady's message, about Medjugorje, about, I just couldn't stop telling people about it. The next year, there was a lady from Letterkenny and she had decided to take a group to Medjugorje and she called me, she hadn't been and she knew nothing about it and she asked me would I help her. So I agreed to help this lady from Letterkenny to organise the group to Medjugorje and she asked me to come with her also and it was the next year in 1986 June and uh, we took a group out, I went with her and when I was there I really felt coming back that I was to bring more people there and I brought another group out in October that year. The following year, 1987, I brought 
hundreds and hundreds out in 1987. I had a full plane load in uh, April 87, I think 187 on that one. I had another one on May, huge group for May, full plane, July, October, um, and, and then the, um, it followed on from then, and since then I've been taking groups to Medjugorje. When I came back from Medjugorje, I really felt the importance of the Mass had come alive for me. The Word of God had come alive for me. And I wanted to go to Mass every day. I wanted, I didn't want to miss Mass. I really felt it was important that the Eucharist was food for my journey and strength for my soul, and that I had to, I had to go to Mass every day, praying the Rosary and encouraging others as well, always encouraging others to, to, to pray the Rosary and the importance of Mass. And after some time, and I always, because the, the sale of the hotel didn't work out, I thought the Lord was going to make this into a retreat centre or do something, change it from being a hotel. And, um, but I was always waiting and waiting for this. And I always believed that the Blessed Sacrament would come here. I used to pray and pray about the Blessed Sacrament. And I, we had a, a room, an old room, where we kept paint, spare beds, junk really and uh, I always believed that that room would, is at the heart of everything in the, in the hotel and that was where the Lord would come to. Uh, one night a man called in and he said, um, he told us his name and he said he used to be here before this house was a hotel. He stayed here uh, uh, and with a bed and breakfast and he said, I was just passing and he said, I would love to have a look around the hotel just to retrace the steps, the places where we used to be. I said, you're welcome. And I was t walking him around, showing him different rooms and places in the hotel. And we came down into this room where I felt the Blessed Sacrament would come to. And when he came into the room, he said, now what's this used to be here? And he's standing thinking and thinking. And he said, that big thick wall, that, this was, that was the outside wall of the house. And he said, what was in there? And he, was like, and he said, I remember. He said, Father Seamus O'Connell lived here and he didn't have a priest's house, but he had a little chapel. And he said, the chapel was right there, right there. And we, the Blessed Sacrament was there. And we were able to get the key of the chapel and go in and spend time in prayer in that little chapel. Well, my heart nearly jumped out of me. And I thought, wow, maybe I'm not crazy after all. Maybe this is really going to happen. In October of that year, a very famous priest came to stay here. It was totally by accident because the hotel he was to stay in in Derry had a bomb that night and he ended up coming here. He came here and he, he had a companion. He came for one night and his companion got sick and they ended up staying here for five days. He was, charis he was one of the founders of Charismatic Renewal in America. And when he came here, he, his friend was in bed sick. He kept walking around this place, out round the grounds and all around the place. And before he left, he said, God will be greatly glorified in this place. He said, many important people will come here. About five years later, I had this feeling that it was time to prepare the, the oratory, the chapel, to get it ready. And I went out to Medjugorje. I was taking a group that September, and I said, Blessed Mother, please, please don't let me make a mistake here. Maybe it's just me wants this chapel here. And if it's me, then please don't let it happen. But if it is what the Lord wants, please, Mother, help me here. I don't know what to do. And um, the message that week was, adore my son in the Blessed Sacrament. We got the oratory, the, the, the altar all in place. 
the tabernacle, everything was just like, like that there. In one week it was all completed and done. We had a prayer meeting here every Tuesday night and once a month uh, the priest would allow me to have the Blessed Sacrament. And um, he, he called in one day just after that and I said, Father, I want to show you something. And uh, I brought him down and opened the oratory door and he says, oh my gosh, what have you done? And, um, and he came right in and he said, but he said, it's beautiful. And I said, what do I do now, Father? And he said, what do you mean? What do you do? He said, um, uh, I said, do I go to the bishop or who do I go to? He says, do nothing, nothing. He said, pray, pray. And I said, okay. And uh, the other thing was as well, someone said to me, you know, if you ever want to know a word from the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to open the scriptures and uh, he'll give you a word. So I used to, as I was going through all of this stuff, I would pray to the Holy Spirit and open the scriptures. And it was, Rejoice heart and soul, daughter of Zion. Your king comes humble, riding on a donkey every time. And then I'd think, it's that Bible, it just opens that page. So it, I'd get a different Bible and open. And it was the same, Rejoice heart and soul, daughter of Zion. Your king comes humble, riding on a donkey. So. That was the end of September, so we did nothing. And then Father um, came down one Sunday night in December for something, and uh, he came in for five minutes, and he stayed for five hours talking and talking. And he says, I've been thinking about your oratory, and we had a new parish priest on our parish at the time, and he said, I think you need to go to the new parish priest and, and ask him about, about your oratory. And I said, Father, I don't even know him. I, I, I mean, he doesn't know me. I don't know him. And he said, well, just wait for the opportunity. And uh, so that five days later, we had a parish dinner and the new parish priest walked in. And uh, so I was over beside him like a bee around honey. And I said, Father, there's something I'd really like you to see. And he says, yes, an oratory, I believe. And I said, how do you, how do you know? And he said, uh, oh, someone was saying that you have an oratory in the hotel. So uh, when dinner was over, I brought him down and uh, I said, Father, now that you're here, I have to ask you a very hard question. But I said, you don't have to answer it tonight. Tomorrow you can take as long as you want, but I just have to ask it. And he said, well, my concern would be how, how secure would the Blessed Sacrament be? And I said, Father, I guard it with my life. I said, do I go to the bishop, Father? And he said, no, he said, it's easier to get forgiveness and permission. So um, he gave me permission and it was the feast of the 8th of December, the Immaculate Conception. And when I got home that night, I opened my scriptures and again, it was the same reading. And I, I called my priest and he said, I will have the Blessed Sacrament down tomorrow. And the Blessed Sacrament came at that, that weekend. And it was Our Lady, Our Lady, all the way. People are experiencing so many difficulties in families, so many problems. And the answer is so simple, you know, the rosary. I believe that's what Our Lady wants us to know. My name is Michael O'Neill and I'm the Miracle Hunter. We're talking today about the Marian devotions and the images that inspire those devotions from around the world. One of the famous devotions of the Virgin Mary is Our Lady of Charity del Cobre from Cuba. One of the most incredible stories is that of the tradition in uh, Cuba starting in the year 1600 or so, when three men, uh, Rodrigo, Juan de Hoyos, and another Juan, a slave, were out on a boat trying to get some salt in order to preserve the meat for the town. When they were out on the water, the, it became a great storm and they thought that they were going to die. The slave had a medal to Our Lady on it and he began to pray for protection. 
The other two men joined him and eventually the storm subsided and they were fine. When they looked into the distance, they saw an image. They thought it was a bird. And when it got closer and closer, they thought it was a statue of a girl. When they brought it aboard their boat, they found that it was dry despite being out in the water. And it was an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And on that statue, it said, I am the mother of charity. And they brought that image back to the townspeople who venerated it. And it became known as miraculous. Many cures and many other miracles are attributed to Our Lady of Charity, Del Cobre, from Cuba in the early 1600s. Towards God. Rise up.